Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. Will the pandemic lead us to rethink our relationship with nature? Let's get to the bottom line. Today, we take a step back from the usual ups and downs of American politics to talk about something much wider and crucial to our future, the planet that we live on. For tens of thousands of years, humans, and that means you, me, our ancestors, have been manipulating the environment for economic gain. It's just what we do. We move mountains that shouldn't be moved, cut down trees, overfish, eradicate diverse species from the face of the earth. The world economy is not designed to promote environmental sustainability, at least not yet. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's built for endless consumption of resources. The question today is whether in the middle of this horrible pandemic, can we push reset? Can we get back to normal in a way that restores balance with the natural world? And we're talking to one of the most influential advocates for the health of the planet. Jane Goodall has been a leading voice for conservation and protection of wildlife for decades, ever since she spent decades studying chimpanzees in the wild and opened our eyes to broader questions in the scientific world. In many ways, she has become the ever-present, responsible voice of our conscience, without which we could even be more destructive. Dr. Goodall, it's very good to be with you today to talk about these important issues. And I'm going to start where we last met, which was in Davos, Switzerland, at the World Economic Forum, where I saw you blow away um, a lot of the rich and powerful in the world. But today, uh, the World Economic Forum started this week online, and Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, made this statement. We are waging war on nature and destroying our life support system, and nature is striking back. I'd like to get your comments about that because he's both warning, you know, the rich and powerful that the world is descending into chaos and telling them they better get on it. Do you agree with him? Is there more to the story that we should be discussing? Well, I, I certainly agree with him. You know, I've been saying for ages, and I probably said it to you before, but we, compared to our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees, the biggest difference is the explosive development of our intellect. and. There's no question. I mean, chimps are highly intelligent. Other animals are too. But I mean, I mean, think we, we've designed a rocket that went to Mars and a robot that took photos of Mars. And it, it, it's amazing what we have been able to do. Isn't it bizarre that this most intellectual creature is destroying its only home? We don't want to go and live on Mars. We've seen what it looks like there. I mean, I don't want to go live there. I'm sure you don't either. And so we've only got this one beautiful planet and we are in the process of destroying it there's no question but if our intellect is as amazing as i think it is then we do have the ability if 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 we get together around the world without wasting time and try to heal some of the harm and at least slow down climate change which by the way is a much more existential threat to our future and the future of life on Earth than this pandemic, horrible though this pandemic is. Look, I know the world does not revolve around the United States, but we do have a new president. And one of the four pillars that he's put out there that he says he wants to embed in all of his policy actions is, is action on climate change. And you've just mentioned that. Um, are you uh, buoyed up? Are you hopeful by what you've seen? Uh, from, from President Biden so far? Do you think this is an inflection point for American leadership on these issues in a way that matters? Or, you know, and, and I think we've always, you know, heard things, but you know, we have this line, you know, will, will they have walked the walk? What is your sense of it? Well, my sense is he's already walked the walk. He's already committed to rejoining the um, Paris Climate Agreement. And, you know, I think, I think, well, I feel, and I know hundreds of American friends of mine, that we have a new possibility in the United States, which after all is the most economically powerful still. And all these terrible restrictions on protecting the environment that the Trump administration put into place, Biden has committed to, to changing. And he's already kind of begun that, as far as I understand. So I'm very hopeful. Well, Dr. Goodall, I have now spent hours, many, many hours upon hours watching, uh, as much as we've been able to see, your relationship with chimpanzees. And I guess I want to ask in a non-facetious way, in a serious way, I mean, if they were in charge of this planet, what could we learn from them 
about how they deal with their environment. How, I mean, what would you say are the biggest lessons we could draw uh, from the primates you've spent so much time uh, connecting with? Well, you know, this is really a question that isn't going to really help us very much because the way chimpanzees are not, they're not um, overpopulating their environment the way we are. They're not using complex technological innovations um, but they would if they could. And, you know, in the old days, and if you go into some of the people who are still living out in the forest, they are not harming their environment. But again, they would if they could. And I think from the time of the Industrial Revolution, when food began to be more and more plentiful, we started, our population began growing. And that was the beginning of the rot. I think that's a very fair answer. You know, I thought about it, but I mean, there is a there is a beauty out there. And it was one of the things that I've been thinking about um, all of us being very smart animals, smart uh, uh, folks with our environment, being able to manipulate it, as I mentioned in the introduction. But it raises this question when, when we have a pandemic and we have a virus that literally is, uh, in a way, hunting us down to some degree. You know, we have the ability, I think, potentially to survive it. But that victimhood, that notion, one of a zoonotic virus passed from animals to humans and passed from animals to other animals. Whether or not I, I, you think there's a there's a chastening in that, a moment uh, where we have to be humble and look at the fact that uh, there, are, there are elements of, of what we're doing that are quite dangerous that we need to ch uh, change course. I absolutely do think it. I mean, <clears throat> this pandemic has disrupted economies around the world. It's led to death. It's led to suffering. It's led to loss of jobs. And we now know that this is because we have so disrespected animals and the natural world. We've created conditions where these pathogens can jump from animals to people. And it's been predicted by those studying zoonotic diseases for a long time. And, you know, the next one could be far worse. Ebola had a very high rate of death to infection. And this pandemic doesn't but supposing the next one kills so many more people like it would if it was ebola if ebola was in as infectious as covid so we really do need to rethink our relationship with the natural world of which we are part and on which we depend and our relationship with the animals with whom we should share this planet do you have thoughts on this time on COVID and what, what kind of red warning lights are going off that worry you? Well, the, the warning lights are simply that, as I say, we've disrespected animals. We're treating them in ways that, I mean, you know, the golden rule of every single major religion around the world is do to others as you would have them do to you. And animals are sentient beings. They're not just things. And we're treating them as though they're commodities. And this, if you care about animals the way I do, if you understand their sentience, then this is, it, it's a black mark against our humanity, actually. And we really do need to change that. You know, it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, you can tell about the, um, something about the nation by the way it treats its animals. We're not treating animals correctly and it's not just the wildlife and the bushmeat markets and the wildlife markets of Asia and and the, and the trafficking it's also our factory farms we all over the world we are mistreating our animal well if I want to sound silly I'll say brethren but that's what the Native Americans would say I mean, it's a fascinating challenge. I'm wondering, as you and the, and, the, and the Jane Goodall Institute have worked around the world, I'd just be interested, you know, I look at these moments as show and tell opportunities. Are, are, are there moments in your institution's work that you've been able to turn this around that we can talk about and say, here's a positive way that we've been able to change the way gravity worked around uh, preservation, mutual respect for species, uh, sustainable environmental practices. You know, I, I, I would love to see those stories told more often. I'm just not as aware of them as I should. But what are some of those that are, are top of mind for you? Okay, well, one of them is that 
Um, when I first went to Africa in 1960, Gombe National Park, where we still study the chimpanzee, was part of that equatorial forest belt, stretched right across equatorial Africa. And by 1990, it was a, Gombe was a small island of forest surrounded by totally bare hills. And there were clearly more people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere. And it was very clear we can't help these people find ways of making a living without destroying the environment. We can't save chimps, forests, or anything else. So we began our program called Take Care of Takari. And by working with the people, by working in such a way that they came to trust us, by developing a very holistic program, which included microcredit opportunities for women, scholarships to keep girls in school, water management projects, uh, and, and everything else. Uh, if you fly over Gombe today, you will not see the bare hills anymore. So when you work with the local communities, when you help them understand that saving the environment is for their own future, not just wildlife, then you get partners in conservation. And this program is now in six other African countries. So that's one piece of really good news. We're ready to, to scale it up. And also in our program for youth, the Roots and Shoots program, we've seen change in young people in refugee camps. Um, they begin to understand that animals aren't just things. And that's not the way they were brought up. Their culture doesn't tell them that. So I have seen a lot of change. And actually, I always say the media is at fault because uh, they just concentrate on the doom and the gloom, which is important. But please give space to all these wonderful things, amazing people, terrific projects, uh, which are so hopeful that are happening all around the world new ways of agriculture, new ways of treating animals, pushing for social justice, trying to get rid of discrimination, all of these things, they're happening. But we don't talk about them as much as all the destruction that we're causing. Do I we? like to talk about uh, positive things, but I also you know, want to recognize the things that aren't going so well. But I know you started a new line of podcasts uh, Dr. Goodall, um, and I think they're called Hope Casts, uh, uh, which I learned just at, you know, I think you just started at the beginning of the year. Um, and and I guess, you know, I, 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 you are hopeful, right? You are hopeful. I mean, you're not, despite all of these things we just talked about, my sense is you are hopeful. Well, I'm hopeful if, I mean, it's not, it's not just carte blanche. It's, um, we, we have a window of time, I'm pretty sure, and I'm not the only scientist to say that, but we can only succeed in turning things around if we get together now. That's why I was traveling 300 days a year around the world talking about these things. This is why since I've been grounded here in England, in where I grew up, but we created a virtual chain, and this Hopecast is part of that. I've reached millions more people sitting here um, around the world in many more countries than if I was traveling. But it's so exhausting. I mean, it's nonstop doing things like this, gazing at little specks of camera in the top of your laptop. And I miss meeting the people. I miss having fun evenings with my friends. But it's reaching many more people. So I go on doing it, don't I? I have no choice, really. We're very <laughs> grateful for that. And I guess my question to you, because you know these people, they many donate to your programs and support you. They want to spend time with you and be in your company. But do they, are they doing enough? I mean, I mentioned the World Economic Forum before. They're meeting this week. And I just wonder myself, OK, what have you done since last year, folks? Have you really moved the needle in a credible way? Or is this a kind of uh, vanity uh, uh, island where, where the rich and powerful get together? I'd just love to get your sense of what you think has happened in terms of the time you've talked to, to, to that crowd and whether they've begun to move the needle in ways that you think matter for the planet Earth? I think some of them definitely have. I think more people are donating, putting some of their large fortunes into programs that will help um, to save the planet, to turn things around. Um, I know that the World Eco Economic Forum itself has pushed a whole new emphasis on the environment, which wasn't there before. 
Um, so, you know, these are hopeful signs, but we need to, we need more. It, it's not quite enough. But on the other hand, leadership from some of the really, really wealthy people is perhaps encouraging other people to donate more freely to saving the planet for the future. I mean, you know, these people have children, grandchildren, and they do care. And when you sort of look at them and you try and tell stories to reach the heart, you can see a change, you see the eyes change. So that's so important. And that's why I, maybe I can do it a little bit on a screen like this, but it's not the same as when you're there with somebody. And you know, I've always said, we can only reach our true human potential when head and heart work in harmony. Too many people separate those two. I couldn't agree with you more uh, on that, but on the part of the head side, you know, I had this crazy idea once, I wanted to create a global map and in different parts of the world or different countries, I wanted to give a rating on whether Galileo would be found guilty or not, you know, to go back to the Galileo trials. And I sort of felt in the United States in the last four years that even though technology, as you mentioned, has, has you know, accelerated and, and we have so many incredible opportunities on so many fronts that I sort of felt Galileo probably wouldn't get off, you know, in America. Now I'm beginning to feel it's a little bit different, but I, I'm just interested in the state of science in the world and the respect for science. If you go to developing countries, I often find a greater respect for science, for doctors, for research than I do in the developed part of the world. Do you, do you find that? I think so. Um, I've found uh, some countries, developing countries, have little regard for science. I think it depends on, on the government that's in power. And, you know, move towards some of these more autocratic governments. If they don't like the science, they don't believe in it. And it's the same sort of um, attitude that the Trump administration had. And I've seen that everywhere. So I think in just about every country, there are those people who truly, truly respect science and, and are encouraged by what it can do. And then there are other people who find it inconvenient I mean, like Al Gore's inconvenient truth, it's much better not to believe uh, in climate change if you want to carry on making emissions. Well, don't believe it, then it doesn't matter. And it's like working with animals. Most scientists now agree that animals are sentient, they have emotions, they feel pain. But if you're in a business that is treating animals in a very cruel, horrible way, it's much more convenient to consider that they're just things, isn't it? I, I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the other things that I don't know if you've discussed much, but I, I imagine it has come up is you started so early as this pioneering anthropologist, the extraordinary relationship that we've all seen and grown up with. You're a model for many other women and people, but also women going into science. I'm just interested because I don't know the answer to this. Have, have, have you seen, you know, we, we talk about gender and, 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 and gender equity and science. Have you found that your role and model have, have brought both men and as many women uh, into the field of science that you've, you've been part of? Well, I think more women certainly have come in, but you know, I think, I think there's a reason why girls weren't going into science. It wasn't just um, sexual discrimination, gender discrimination. But when, when I first went to Cambridge University, I'd been with the chimps two years. I had never been to college, but I was supposed to do a PhD. And I was taught the difference between humans and animals was one of kind, and that we were the only beings with personality, mind, and emotion. But I was also taught that to be a good scientist, you had to be coldly objective. You should not have empathy with your subject. And of course, I knew that was wrong. I was taught by my dog. And I mean, if you have empathy, that leads you to all kinds of I, aha moments. That's what that means. And then you can test it. But I think that it, what I did sort of softened the idea of science to many young girls. And I think perhaps there is some kind of inborn 
gentleness in women because their, their role in evolution has been to raise families, more patience, more tolerance perhaps. And although, you know, it, it's, it, culture changes that in a way, but maybe there's something in that that girls appreciated. Do, do you, um, have you been able to see or be with your chimpanzee family, um, friends, I shouldn't call them family, but your acquaintances uh, during this crisis, or have you had to uh, be distant from them as well? Yeah, I've been here. I've been I literally since um, March. I've been grounded here. And uh, so you're traveling the world via the, via the net like we all are. Uh, it's just yeah. I saw some very beautiful pictures of, of, of chimpanzees that had been rescued, one that came over, and I probably have the timestamp on it, and that came to hug you and, 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 and caress you and help hold you. Uh, it's one of the most moving things, but it looked as if it were recent, so we're probably, uh, probably off on that. But, may, but maybe that happened you know, just before the COVID crisis happened. It did. And you know the strange thing about that? That was Wunder. And uh, she came in very sick, and our veterinarian executive director of the sanctuary saved her life. I met her that day, the day she was released onto this island, and met her before. I, I was on the boat with her, and I, I was trying to comfort her because she must have been worried what's happening to me now. And yet it was me that she came and embraced. And if you remember that footage, she climbs out of her crate, she climbs onto the top of it, she looks around, and then she does a double take and comes back and embraces me. It was the most moving thing that's ever happened to me. And I, one of the guys said, how does, she, how does that chimp know that this lady is responsible for it all? Of course, she didn't, but... It was an extraordinary moment, and I encourage everyone to see it. I hope we can uh, put a little uh, uh, connection to that. Let me just ask you, just as we get um, uh, to the close here, you you said two things, that our greatest danger is apathy. Um, but you've also said that there are many ways to move in the right direction. And I just like our, our viewers and listeners from all over the world to hear from you, what are some of the ways Jane Goodall thinks that we can move in the right direction and avoid apathy? Well, I think apathy comes when you lose hope. And when you lose hope, you do nothing. And that's the danger. And some people feel helpless and hopeless. And I always say to them, but, you know, find, okay, you can't change the world. None of us can change the world single-handed. But where you live, is there something you could do? Could you raise money for the homeless? Could you volunteer in a soup kitchen? Could you pick up trash? Could you write letters to try and save a local um, environment like a, a wood or a forest or something like that? If you get involved and you get involved with other people, suddenly you realize, yes, I do make a difference. And then the energy to do more. And I, I think that people need to understand that every single day we live, we make some impact on the planet. And we have a choice as to what kind of impact we make. What do we buy? Where does it come from? Did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of child slave labor? Make the ethical choice when millions and then billions of people make those ethical choices. But that'll never happen in big enough numbers until we alleviate poverty. Because when you're really poor, you just do what you have to do to live cut down the trees because you're desperate to get land to grow more food to feed your family. Buy the cheapest junk food. You can't ask all those ethical questions because you've got to stay alive. Well, Dr. Jane Goodall, uh, you're one, someone who makes me hope that I hope that we begin to move in the right direction. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you too. Thank you for inviting me. So what's the bottom line? Listening to the wisdom of people like Jane Goodall helps us to get out of our narrow boxes and remember how much we're part of the natural world and how much our existence depends on the survival of other species. Zoonotic diseases like COVID-19, Ebola, N1H1, Zika, 
came from mankind's intrusion into the habitat of animals. We can rip up and wound the earth, but it's gonna bite back. So maybe the silver lining in this COVID story is that it chastens us. Dr. Goodall talks about hope. So my hope is that her work will inspire us all to action, to have a greater respect for nature and give the environment a much higher priority. And that's the bottom line. Thank you.